All right. We'll try to make it uh, as brief as possible. I know that we are uh, we are carrying on into the evening here, but I want to, as I told uh, Pastor Mike Fix, to make us uh, cover as much ground as possible this evening. And uh, by the way, just this is the last time I'm going to talk, I want to say it's a, it's a privilege and honor letting me uh, explain some of these things to you. And again, we love your church at Fellowship Baptist Church, and we're privileged to know you and, and be in a relationship together. The next logical place for us to review the evolution of today's social justice movement is what is called black liberation theology. And so we're going to turn our attention from Latin America and Switzerland to a private liberal arts college in Adrian, Michigan. The year is 1969. An Arkansas native and a professor named James Cone wrote his book formulating his new theology. The book was entitled Black Theology and Black Power. And in this book, he made a shocking claim. And his claim was that black power, quote, as he called it anyway, was defined as black people asserting their humanity that white supremacy denied, and that that was the gospel. That was the gospel, he said. And within a year, he would be a professor at Union University in New York. His theology would grow wildly within the predominantly African-American church in America. Cone was a minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is the first African American uh, founded denomination. And as you can guess from the name, they're of African descent, they're Methodist in their theology, and they have an Episcopal form of government, which is where they get their name. And in 1970, Cone wrote a book, A Theology, excuse me, uh, A Black Theology of Liberation. You can see its ties to liberation theology. A Black Theology of Liberation where he further formulated his new, his new uh, theology. Now, it's here that I should give a very clear disclaimer about Cone's shocking thesis that black power is the gospel. He claimed, again, black power was defined as black people asserting their, their humanity that white supremacy denied. We have to stop there, and we have to enthusiastically exclaim with all conviction that white supremacy is evil and contrary to the word of God. So let me emphasize carefully but enthusiastically that all people are made in God's image. All people come from a common set of parents whose names are Adam and Eve, who are literal and historic people, and that no ethnicity is innately superior to any other ethnicity, and to say so defames the image of God. Likewise, biologically, medically, Scientifically, there is no such thing as race, implying different categories of what we know to be humanity. Right. So not only should we not be racist, you should not be a racialist. Right. Don't believe in the concept of race. It is biologically untenable, and it is theologically unacceptable. Amen. It doesn't exist. There are ethnicities, but there are not races. Again, no Jew, no Greek, no Scythian, no slave, no freedman. No man should own another man because that's stealing. Yeah. The reason we don't believe in reparations is the same reason we don't believe in theft by, by taxation. And it's the same reason that we don't believe in slavery. And that's because it all violates the Eighth Commandment. If you want to undergird your argument against slavery, then teach theft by taxation. No, the reason slavery is bad is because we don't believe that we're entitled to the goods, the labor, or the fruit of someone's labor. That's not us. That's what makes slavery bad. It's theft. And that's what makes most of their policies that they're promoting in social justice equally as bad. And so the problem is not the first part of Cone's thesis, which is white supremacy is bad. We agree. The problem is the second part of his thesis, in which he said that it is the gospel. That's the problem. Black people asserting humanity over white supremacy is the gospel. This is the point in which all of God's people have to say, listen, white supremacy is a loathsome thing. And while our brothers of different ethnicities must all be treated equally because they are equal, the gospel is defined by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 the death, the burial, the resurrection. The gospel is God's plan through the death, burial, and resurrection to save individual sinners by the blood of Christ. So understand this principle. The gospel will save individuals 
And that will, in effect, bring individuals together collectively. Right. We believe this. It's called the church. Mm -hmm. God has called into himself one people, one holy nation. He's bringing in multiple tribes and tongues and languages into one tribe, one tongue, one language, one thing in common, which happens to be Jesus. The gospel does not save collective peoples or identity groups just to separate us as individuals, which effectively is what Marxism does. It's designed, again, to divide. So the problem with black liberation theology, as Cohn would describe it, isn't that liberation is bad. If by liberation we mean equal treatment under the law and equal worth before God, then that's a good, godly, and honorable goal. However, the gospel is specific. Now, get this. If Paul anathematized the Galatians for having something seemingly so small as the Judaizers had wrong, if he anathematized them for having the gospel wrong by an inch, one wonders what Paul would do with liberation theologies, theology who missed the gospel by a mile. Yeah. If that's how he treated the Galatians, how do you think he treated James Cone? Cone's presumption, which he was quite clear about, is that white American churches preach the gospel that he said was built upon white supremacy. His argument is that when so-called white churches, which I'm not sure what that is exactly, interpret the scripture, they come up... Mike, you got a white church here, or you have a church with white people in it, I presume. There's probably a difference. He said that white churches interpret the scripture. They come up with this stuff about the gospel saving individuals from sin so as to suppress the real gospel, which is, he said, black liberation. Come, by the way, I remember um, Brother Trent probably remembers this, or remembers me talking about it, planting a church uh, in North Dakota in the... Southern Baptist Church planners wanted to know what kind of church we were going to plant. Will it be an oil-filled church? No. Is it going to be an Indian church? No. How about a cowboy church? No. As far as I know, it's okay for cowboys and Indians to worship together. It, it can happen. We're not planting a specific kind of church. We want to reach people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Amen. And those men from the Southern Baptist Convention laughed at me and asked what book I had been reading. Yeah. They meant what church planting book I had been reading. Right. And I said, the Bible. Yeah. That's right. I'm not quite sure that they had heard of it, but it's the one with the leather cover yeah. and the shiny pages. Yeah. And so, Cone's presumption, again, is that white churches have corrupted the gospel. He viewed everything through the lens of skin color. Even the ethnicity of Christ, as a matter of fact, Cohn said, quote, I was on a mission to transform self-loathing Negro Christians into black-loving revolutionary disciples of the black Christ. Mm -hmm. wow. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you, if someone hasn't already, that Jesus was not white. If by white, we mean Caucasian. Right. Uh, he was Middle Eastern. He was a Jewish man. He was not a Palestinian man. He was a Jewish man. I'll also be the first to tell you, because Palestine doesn't exist, look at a map. That's, that's I'll also right. be the first to tell you that if Jesus were Caucasian or black or Asian or Indian, it wouldn't matter if he was. Yeah. It wouldn't matter if he happened to have been the black Christ, so long as that wouldn't mess up him being the chosen seed from yeah. Eve going through Abraham. I don't care what his pigment was. To be fair to Cone, he wasn't arguing that Jesus was African necessarily. He was arguing that we should, quote, this is what he said, visualize Jesus according to who we are today, being the poor and the oppressed. So we should visualize Jesus according to who we are, the poor and the oppressed. Let me say it again. Visualize Jesus. Listen, this is why the second commandment exists. Right. Stop imaging Jesus at all. Thank right. you very much. Amen. Don't image Christ, because when you do, he's going to look a lot like you. Yeah. We should reject that notion from the very beginning. And so he's arguing that Jesus would look like the oppressed because he came and he helped people and they must have been oppressed. And so he identified with the oppressed. And today, black folks are the oppressed. And so he's going to identify with black folks. There are a few problems with that theology other than uh, merely the... The second commandment, although that is why we don't do flannel graphs or have a stained glass Jesus. We try to avoid that type of thing. And so it's, it's almost like how cultures view Santa Claus. White people have a white Santa, black people have a black Santa. That's not how Jesus is, okay? That's right. That's, he doesn't evolve with their culture, and he probably doesn't look like you. Secondly, 
unless you're you know, a Middle Eastern Jew. Secondly, Jesus is God, and God is immutable. It's That's one of right. his primary attributes. So Jesus isn't any different today than he was then, than when he was when he ascended into heaven. He has a glorified body. It doesn't age or change. And so he's not evolving, changing, or re-identifying himself. He doesn't have dysphoria or identity yeah. issues. Yeah. He's not a juvenile who's constantly reimagining their self-image. Third, Jesus does not conform to us, That's right. but we are to conform to him. Yeah. Fourth, Jesus did not come to identify with a specific demographic, whether poor or rich, black or white, or any such thing. God could not be clear he's not a respecter of persons. He is called, he is called the Son of Man. Yeah. He came to represent mankind. He doesn't have to be a Jesus for black people or a Jesus for white people or a Jesus for poor people or a right. Jesus for rich people. He's Jesus for people. Amen. He's the Messiah coming to the world. Now, let me add briefly that any church on any continent, among any ethnicity, including in America, we should consider if we're reading our culture into the scripture instead of building our culture out of the scripture. We should also stop and think, yeah. do we have right. a false cultural lens of who Jesus is? It doesn't hurt to ask that question. However, that's exactly what Cone was suggesting we do, that we read into the scripture our culture. That's called eisegesis, by the way, yeah. and it's not a good thing. That's right. And, and by the way, if, white, if the white church had corrupted the gospel for whiteness, two wrongs don't make a right, does it? Yeah. To corrupt it for the sake of blackness? Now, this hermeneutical, uh, hermeneutical method of intentional eisegesis, that means reading things into the scripture, that's how Cohen viewed the Bible. And he claimed that the traditional interpretations of the Bible go back thousands of years, and they've all been tainted by white supremacy. This is a conspiracy theory that, that tops flat earthism. It's, 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 it's greater than Sasquatch. It's historically really absurd, considering that Christianity did not start in Europe. It's borderline asinine in every respect. The traditional view of the Bible's narrative is that the Exodus account, this is uh, the biblical notion of the Exodus, that it was about God redeeming his covenant people from slavery, the shedding of the Lamb's blood so that death would pass over them, that they might cross the river of the Jordan uh, or the Red Sea into the wilderness, and after a time there, eventually cross the Jordan and go into the promised land God had prepared for them. Jesus taught us that the Exodus applies to us, mm -hmm. and it is a typological That's foreshadow right. of his accomplished work, Amen. meaning that we were once in bondage to sin and slavery. The blood of the Lamb of God was shed, and if we are covered by that blood, death will pass over us. Yeah. We will be crossing through the waters of baptism into a time of sojourning as a pilgrim in this life. And then we will cross through and enter into the land that God has prepared for us, Amen. the New Jerusalem. That's how we interpret the Exodus account. It was historical, it was literal, but it meant something. Yeah. God is the architect of the ages and he designed it to foreshadow Amen. Christ. James Cone, on the other hand, argued that what the Exodus was about was Hebrew empowerment, the liberation of an oppressed people group, and that God identified with the poor and the downtrodden. And that's the point of the Exodus story. So this is how he's interpreting every aspect of Scripture. It's all about, well, the way Marx viewed everything, oppressed versus the oppressors. He would say the biblical narrative is that the scripture is about God identifying with the oppressed. The worst and most dangerous of Cohn's theological inventions was his exchange of the doctrine of substitutionary atonement for what is called the Christus liberator model of the atonement, in which he denies that Jesus died in the stead for sinners. But he says, quote, Christ was crucified by the imperial powers <laughs> And his resurrection was an assertion of divine sovereignty against the imperial powers. Wow. So to come on, Jesus' death and resurrection was about God defending the oppressed. It wasn't about a payment for sin. In fact, he puts it this way directly. He says, quote, what else can the crucifixion mean except that, I want to answer the question already, don't you? <laughs> what else can the crucifixion mean, pick me, 
except that God, the Holy One of Israel, became identified with the victims of oppression. What else can the resurrection mean except that God's victory in Christ is the poor person's victory over poverty? If theology does not take this seriously, how can it be worthy of the name Christian? If, okay, let me stop here. Listen, if you read the story of Jesus and you think Jesus is identifying with you as the victim and you don't see yourself as the victimizer, you got the story backwards. You're not Jesus That's in the right. account. You're at best Barabbas and probably the Roman soldiers. That's right. You got it backwards. This goes back to Karl Marx envisioning yep. man as God. You see this. I want you to see how these things are interconnected. I forget where I was at in the quotation. It doesn't matter. That is what Cohn would call the white man's interpretation of the gospel. It's got to be about oppression. Now, Cohn was a student of Malcolm X. He was an admirer of Dr. King. By the way, Dr. King denied the deity of Christ. Yes, he did. He denied the resurrection of yes, Christ. He, he denied the plenary inspiration of Scripture. Yes, he did. And at least according to the FBI and many of his contemporaries, he was a bisexual, a whoremonger, and a womanizer. Yep. Why on earth we were having conferences to venerate that man? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I do know. It's yeah. Yeah. cultural Marxism, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, <clears throat> Cohn was called during his time the most hated theologian in America. And except for the most extreme circles on the left, everyone anathematized him as being a heretic. Almost everybody. However, his ideas came back into public spotlight in 2008 or so, 2008 or so, when an audio from President Obama's pastor, Jeremiah Wright made its way into the news. You remember that? And everyone asked the question, what on earth is this rhetoric? I remember watching a black theologian by the name of Anthony Bradley on the Glenn Beck program back in when he was doing his headline news. And Anthony Bradley explained that liberation theology and its Marxist roots are uh, heretical. He did a very good job of explaining it. Today, Anthony Bradley is one of the chief proponents of liberation theology and says it's insane. He told me, literally, I was insane for saying that it was Marxist. That was him back in 2008. Wow. That's how quickly things change. And they act like, again, we have tinfoil hats. So we see the theology of Cohn now spread to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary where they're promoting his ideology heavily. And many people, when we question Cohn, they'll question um, us why we would not deny necessarily the salvation of, say, Nathaniel Bedford Forrest or Robert E. Lee. Well, let me make this point. As atrocious as human trafficking is, which, by the way, King was, because he engaged in prostitution. That's what we call it, yeah. sex trafficking. As atrocious as human trafficking is, and as repugnant a notion as treating people as chattel is, race-based slavery, as repugnant as that is, racism is not the unforgivable sin. That's right. Racists, many of them will be in heaven. They are wrong and they're sinful. They should stop being racist. Right. But when you deny the reason for the atonement, you will yep. split hell open. Yep. Yep. There's a difference. One of these things is not like the other. By the way, bigotry goes around to all races. I don't know if you've noticed. And now it's the year 2019, and we see that Cone is being heavily promoted in our circles. He's gone from villain to hero. And that is nothing, uh, or rather that is not something that could have been seen a decade ago. If I get in a time machine and go back 10 years and say, in 10 years, Southeastern Baptist Theological yeah. Seminary, which has been known as a, as a haven for Calvinists, will promote James Cone as a fellow believer in Christ, people yeah. would say, you are out of your mind. Yep. Wake right. up, it's 2019. On to the last topic, and that is cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism, as a term, refers to a political philosophy that was formulated in as I, I mentioned this briefly earlier, the Frankfurt School 
which began at the, you can pronounce it several different ways, Goethe or Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. The Institute for Social Research was founded at the university by a Marxist by the name of Karl Grunberg. And he taught at the time at the University of Vienna. It was funded by someone by the name of Felix Will, who was also a Marxist who's known for forming the first Marxist work week. It's like a holiday for commies. <laughs> These men came together with certain others to form the Institute and to put forward spins on Marxist philosophy that could be adopted throughout the world given the context of where Marxism wanted to go. And their ideas were particularly influenced by, this is the weird thing, German Nazism. Uh -huh. Now, they weren't copying German Nazism, they were responding to it. Nazism, as you know, was influenced by Darwinian evolution, yep. which separated men into races. And so then they tried to find, what is the master race, if there are races? And we would say, Darwin was stupid, there's no such thing. We have the Bible, there's no such thing as race. But they founded Nazism upon this concept of, of race, which, by the way, is the same concept of race had by the leftist the evangelicals, and they call us Nazis. I don't quite understand. That became the lens through which these German philosophers viewed the world, because the Nazis viewed things through race. These German philosophers viewed everything through the lens of race. And that became the fabric, the fabric, the foundational principle of what would be known as cultural Marxism. It was a unique combining of Nazi reactionism to Marxism, which would be more so adopted ultimately in Russia, actually, than in Germany. Now, this notion that things in society should be viewed through race was especially pertinent to the philosophers at the Frankfurt School because even though they happen to be Germans, they also, many of them, happen to be Jews. Mm. Jews, in case you aren't familiar, are not popular with Nazis. And so the Jews fled Germany, as would make sense, and many of them were philosophers in the Frankfurt School. In the buildup of the Second World War, these philosophers established their think tank at Columbia University in New York. And after World War II, they reestablished their think tank in West Germany in 1953. The chief philosophical contribution of the Frankfurt School is called critical theory, mm -hmm. which we'll get to, um, well, we probably won't get to tonight, but maybe in, a, in an upcoming lecture at a different point. I'll begin by saying that my use of the term cultural Marxism, I, I was surprised to find out that it's anti-Semitic. That's right. Saying something is culturally Marxist is, is anti-Semitic. I found that out when a liberal Baptist newspaper in Missouri criticized me and my website, and they called it anti-Semitic. I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> anti-Semitic has never been one. So I called the editor on the phone, and I said, this is J.D. Hall. Uh, why, which, out of curiosity, why would you argue that my website is anti-Semitic? And he argued, well, you criticize George Soros. <laughs> I said, I'm not tracking. Well, George Soros is a Jew, and you criticize George Soros, which means you must be anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. I said, friend, if there were an Olympic sport of jumping to conclusions, you'd get a gold medal. <laughs> you have to do some serious gymnastics yeah. Yeah. to come up with that conclusion. If you criticize a Jew, you must be Jewish. And so it turns out, again, that some people would say the use of the term cultural Marxist is, is racist. Although these Jews were influenced by Nazi racialism and the same Darwinian concepts undergird the Holocaust, that undergirded the Holocaust also undergirds today's philosophical worldview, I think we should all be mature enough to realize that just because you criticize someone's beliefs, it doesn't mean that you have a problem with the race of that individual. There's a lot of white people that I would disagree with. Or for all of those who may hate this lecture on social justice, I might blame them for being prejudiced against hillbillies because they disagree with my position. But consider this for an example. The notion that if you disagree with someone, it has to be because of the race, is actually the product of the Frankfurt School. That's the ideology in action. It must be because they're Jews that you disagree. That is what cultural Marxism is. So they say, listen, cultural Marxism isn't a thing. You're making that up. Actually, no, like there are whole books devoted to the subject, and a cultural Marxist thought up that term. I'll get to that in just a moment, I think. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make up the term. 
But what you're doing right now, saying that it must be because the, you're actually practicing cultural Marxism right now when you say me using the term is racist. Yeah. You're employing that. See, we shouldn't be taken captive by these ideologies and philosophies made up by men. Amen. I recognize that. That's foreign to the Bible. It's not logical, rational, or reasonable, and I reject it on the grounds that it's absurd in Jesus' name. That's dumb. Amen. The term cultural Marxism cannot be understood without first grasping economic Marxism, which we've already covered. Marxism recognizes this class struggle. Cultural Marxism, as I've already explained, uh, designs culture to be divided up so that these classes can unite to overthrow the power structure. Frankfurt, the Frankfurt School, is the think tank that put this plan together. So they argued that the working class wouldn't need to revolt against the bourgeoisie, but blacks could revolt against whites, homosexuals could revolt against heterosexuals, women could revolt against men, students could revolt against universities, mm. and etc. There's another name for this though. It's called identity politics. Mm. It is the idea that you need to identify by your identity group. The point is, you get to identify with a particular group that is perceived or it could be real, victim, a, a, a real or perceived victim. So the group could be a real victim or it could just be a perceived victim. It doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing. It's all done for propagandic purposes. And for those who can identify with a victim group, you can pit them against those in perceived or real oppressor groups. So if you're black, you must be underprivileged. If you're white, you have to be overprivileged. There's no such thing as poor white trash. You have to be overprivileged. Congratulations, all you overprivileged people in Bismarck, North Dakota. You know what it's like to be in the 1%, I guess. You're going to go home to your champagne dreams and caviar and, and yachts. Mm. So I don't know how you're going to float away from here in your yacht. But <laughs> I'm sure you can because you're white. And this is why we have people making up identities that they don't actually have yeah. right because there is power in victimhood yeah someone who's not a native american claiming to be so someone who's not black claiming to be so a uh, homosexual who's not been beat up right claiming to have been so yeah. people inventing victimhood because in the frankfurt school victimhood is what gives someone power yeah. it's a political move yeah. don't disagree with me I'm a victim. That's right. How dare you? Now, that's why it's called cultural Marxism. I was both amused and annoyed at the Gospel Coalition, which again is the chief organization used to promote social justice and evangelicalism today, when its editor, Joe Carter, claimed last month that the term cultural Marxism was racist. And he didn't say it was anti-Semitic, as did the, the guy from the Missouri Baptist paper. He said it was racist. He did so by drawing parallels between a theology that is known as kinism, which is basically theonomy and a clanhood, and a recent synagogue shooter who happened to use the term cultural Marxism in a Facebook rant. So here is his thinking. Because a synagogue shooter happened to have been a kinist, which is racism essentially, for lack of a better term, it's certainly racialism, although it might be less racist than what we see in progressive leftism today. Yeah. Because he used the term cultural Marxism and he was a racist, therefore the term is racist. Yeah. Which means I guess I can't use the word the either, because he also used that word. <laughs> so I had to correct him. Carter, you see, took that argument, I found out, from a 2003 Southern Poverty Law Center article. Mm -hmm. He stole it. Mm -hmm. The Southern Poverty Law Center and the Gospel Coalition running the same material, the same ideas, the same thoughts. Mm -hmm. Dirty suckers. <laughs> Fine bedfellows, those two. Did you ever think you'd love to see the day that the Southern Poverty Law Center would be spearheading ideology in evangelicalism? Mm, no. The notion that it's racist is quite popular, though, as of late. One website says, quote, the term more recently, that is cultural Marxism, it more recently refers to anti-communist propaganda and a conspiracy theory spread by paleoconservatives and invented by Nazi Germany pre-war, originally labeled as cultural Marxism as a part of their uh, uh, degradation theory. 
According to the nonsense conspiracy theory, Jews, the Frankfurt School, and other left-wingers have infiltrated media, academia, and the sciences in a decades-long plot to undermine Western culture. It's essentially an Illuminati conspiracy, but taken seriously for some reason. Again, I guess we all need to wear our tinfoil hats. I'd like to think that in the brief time I've been with you this evening, I've taken the time to historically document the roots of what is being taught as social justice through cultural Marxism, liberation theology, black liberation theology, and its historic roots with Marxism. It's not a conspiracy theory. That's a fact. And what they're guilty of is propaganda. There's nothing conspiratorial about it. That's the history of cultural Marxism. It is literally what the Frankfurt School intended. It's not conspiratorial. They published their journals. It's right there in front of us. They intended to infiltrate left-wingers into the media, into the academy, and into the sciences designed to undermine Western culture, which I'll remind you is inherently rooted in a biblical worldview. Yeah. That was the goal. Understand this. Here's a philosophy that says, make everything about race or gender or victimhood or being gay, whatever it is. Make it about perceived ethnic uh, or perceived identity. And when you talk about the development of the contra of, of excuse me, when you talk about the development of that ideology, they, they look at you and say, "That's racist." <laughs> no, that's cultural Marxism. Yeah, that's what that is. Now, the term was not invented by those opposed to the Frankfurt School. It was invented by Trent Schroyer in 1973, and Schroyer was a Marxist. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called *The Critique of Domination: The Origins and Development of Critical Theory*. So a Marxist came up with the term cultural Marxist. So if it's racist, y'all are a bunch of racists. It's not me. I didn't invent the term. I'm just using it. You made it up. The simple fact is Marxism is, again, a subversive ideology. Like Satan, who it came from, it disguises itself. Marxism is not honest. And that's why the solution, now this is going to be a bold statement, the solution to Marxism and evangelicalism must be an evangelical style of McCarthyism. Yeah. Because you have to smoke them out. Amen. We need to be able to say, this is Marxism. And I have a lot of friends in the anti-social justice movement called the Contras, who insist that we shouldn't use the word Marxist because they will paint us as racists. Say, listen, we need to look at that and say, calling us racist is like showing kryptonite to Batman. That's not going to work. They say it all they want. We're not... What they want is to scare us from adequately right. labeling what they are. And it's not neo-Marxism. It is textbook Marxism. Created by a man who wanted to cast God from heaven. And you show me a church that promotes social justice, and I'll show you a church that has done its best to cast God from the church. That's right. And that's what we have to go up against. That's, that's the tactical disadvantage we're at when we bend to political correctness. We can't actually describe and define it. Now, the goal and design of cultural Marxism was very intentionally thought out by its intellectual progenitors in order to undermine Western civilization and Christianity. Now, while, while cultural Marxism may seem like a purely political ideology, like classical Marxism or economic Marxism, it has deep consequences for Christendom. <laughs> By viewing everything through the lens of ethnicity or perceived victim status, cultural Marxism is actually an enemy of the true and authentic gospel-centered racial reconciliation. We see this in Galatians 3.28 again, which I won't cite to you for the umpteenth time. No Jew, no Greek, you get the point. Cultural Marxism seeks to disunify rather than to unify the church. If we want to be unified, why are we even using terms like black church, That's white right. church? Now, together for the gospel, last year, David Platt stood up, and the first words out of his mouth were, why are there so many white people here? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And I know the answer. It's not because of the perceived racism of the people in the group. And it's not for a lack of trying. It's because churches were influenced by James Cone, and they replaced the authentic gospel for social religion, That's right. and it gutted them of the Holy Spirit, and God blew out his candlestick. Yeah. 
and it's the same ideology that you are now promoting among the rest of us at Together for the Gospel. And in another 10 years, if you keep it up, there won't be anybody here, regardless of the color of their skin. That's right. So don't duplicate, duplicate what killed the so-called black church everywhere else. Look at history. Amen. Learn from it. Remember, going back to the poison tree, a bad tree produces bad fruit. In every place you look, what the Southern Baptist Convention, the PCA, and more quote-unquote traditionally conservative churches are now promoting in social justice, it's exactly where the Episcopalians, the American Baptists, the ELCA, the PCUSA, it's a, the United Church of Christ, United Methodist Church, and anything with the word united in it was about 40 years ago. Promoting the same things now and expecting a different result. It's not uncommon today to hear evangelical leaders use the term racial justice, a term that is steeped in cultural Marxism. Certain evangelical leaders seeking to bring ethnic harmony to the church are actually inadvertently falling into the century-old game plan of cultural Marxists to cause division. I wrote this years ago, long before we were talking about social justice in the context that we are today. I wrote this, quote, the evangelical intelligentsia is especially prone to espouse cultural Marxism. I think this was 2013, maybe I wrote this. The evangelical intelligentsia is especially prone to espouse cultural Marxism, and examples of them falling for the scheme are multitudinous, as best seen in recent years in the writings of both the Gospel Coalition and the ERLC, which stands for the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, which I discussed previously, led by Russell Moore. And now, indeed, we've proven again that good discernment is bad is better than, or rather, bad discernment is better than good charismatic prophecy every day certainly more accurate. This sermon is important. Amen. Uh, tomorrow there's going to be a lot of good men, as I said, discuss these issues in the Southern Baptist Convention. And a lot of people will be watching. And praise God for them. I know them all. They're, they're, they're all what I would believe to be quote-unquote good men. But if you only address issues like this after they become problems, that's not discernment. Right. That's crisis management. You don't get any discernment brownie points for not seeing the boogeyman up until the point that he takes your purse or scares you. Anymore. That's not discernment. And it's also a day late and a dollar short. Yep. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't end this way. We ask the question, what do we do when we look at evangelicalism falling for this? Because we, most of us in this room, probably greatly admired Albert Mulder, or Tim Keller, or Russell Moore, these guys with the Gospel Coalition, like D.A. Carson, League and Duncan, yep. we probably greatly admired them. What do we do? Where do we turn? And the answer is, you know, if we look at this from a biblical perspective, the vehicle that God uses to change the world, do evangelism, preach the gospel, and make disciples is the local church. Yeah. You don't need the Gospel Coalition. That's right. Yep. You don't need League and Air. Yep. You don't even need Grace to you. And I love those guys over there. But you don't need them. Yeah. You've got the local church. You've got your local pastors. You have the Bible Amen. right there in the pew with you. So, you bar the doors to the church. Hit anybody trying to get in for sinister or subversive purposes. Amen. You let in the lost. You drag them. Preach the gospel to them. It's a great thing to do. But if you don't recognize the teaching is coming from the Bible, if it seems novel or new, mm. put it in the trash can. Yep. Amen. If the church has survived for 2,000 years without it, it doesn't need it now. Yep. Praise the Lord. That being said, I want to turn again to the scripture. We're told, if we have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is. Amen. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you've died, and your faith, and your life, rather, is hidden in Christ and God. Amen. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. 
And on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And, and these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Jew, no Greek, no circumcised, no uncircumcised, no barbarian, no Scythian, no slave, but, uh, or free, but Christ is all and in all. So I'll stop there for a moment and say this. Our identity should be in nothing but that we are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. at least not primarily. We are just a believer. That's where we find identity. So put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with, uh, with one another. This is my exhortation to you, Capital Lights Baptist Church. Bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord God has forgiven you, so that you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Do you see how it has the opposite effect of Marxism? Yes. Not division. Amen. Harmony. Amen. Now, the church obviously is not bricks and mortar, sticks and stones. It's comprised of people who happen to need a place to meet inside bricks and mortar, uh, mortar or sticks and stones because of weather, like we're having right now. So people say, well, church isn't a building. True, but sometimes we need one to keep us out of that that's out there. The church is where when you come in, the church house, I should say, is where when you come in here, it doesn't matter your race. Amen. It doesn't matter, or excuse me, your ethnicity, because race doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter your hobbies, your affinities, what kind of color you like the most. It doesn't matter if you like Netflix or Hulu, if you're a Chevy guy or a Ford guy. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Amen. It ought not matter whether you're black or white. That's right. We're crucified, excuse me, we're baptized into one body with one baptism. Amen. We belong to Christ in Christ. And so we put on love. It binds everything together in perfect harmony. And so let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Amen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Now, in the fellowship meal before... I was telling people at the table, when you read about the early Montanists, uh, heretics, you, you, you know about that heresy because of the writings of Eusebius. And he mentions that the pastor, the bishop of Antioch, and the other pastors spent, quote, no small amount of time disputing with them in the churches. But what we're doing tonight, sometimes this is necessary. Amen. And so here's the goal, beloved. And I rarely use that term with anything but my own church. Beloved. The question is asked, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Yeah. And the answer should be yes. yes. Here. Yeah, in the Capitol Heights Baptist Church. And anything else that tries to distract us from the beautiful message of the gospel, political or otherwise, yeah. gets shoved into the dustbin of history. Amen. Where Christ will wrap it up and throw it away like a used car. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word and your scripture. I pray that you would steal our minds, Father, that you would make them rigid and firm and even narrow, just as the path is that leads to eternal life. Father, fill our minds with that which is good and illumine our minds with the Holy Spirit to understand things that are perhaps more complex than what we might easily be able to comprehend. So give us your spirit to do his work in both our heart and our mind to comprehend and to believe that which we ought. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.